Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to In Conversation, part of Telepresence, a cyber expo hosted by select rising thesis students of the MFA Design and Technology program. It features seven themes highlighting the artist's individual exploration and examination during the past year, all while exploring the potential of non-physical communities. The three-day event includes a digital workshop, a showcase, workshops, and artist talks. I am Bhavya, a rising thesis student at the MFA Design and Technology program, and I will be your moderator today. The concept of spatial presence and face-to-face -face human connection is getting radically transformed, especially this year. We are actively seeking new ways of connecting and existing beyond tightly bound physical communities. Um, in this online dialogue, we will discuss new visions of interaction, non-human connection and engagement with designer, social robotist, and emerging technology expert, Carla Diana. Uh, we welcome you. Thank you for um, joining us today. And uh, before we begin our discussion today, I have some brief housekeeping notes for everyone. Uh, we'll begin with Carla's artist talk and presentation, followed by moderated questions and a Q&A for audience towards the end. This talk will be recorded and will be available after the show on our website at mfadt.space as well as on our IGTV. If you're not comfortable with being recorded, kindly turn off your camera. We ask everyone but the artist to have their mic off during the talk. And if you have any question, please either use the Zoom raise your hand function or you can type it in the chat. Uh, during our Q&A portion, we will call on you to unmute and ask your question if you are comfortable. And our, for our community guidelines, um, this is a safe space. We expect everyone as speakers and viewers to treat others with respect, care and sensitivity. Um, so we can begin with Carla's uh, presentation. Just before that, I would like to tell everyone a little bit about Carla. Uh, Carla is a designer, author, and educator who explores the impact of future technologies through hands-on experiments in product design and tangible interactions. She has designed a range of products from robots to connected home appliances, and her designs have appeared on the covers of Popular Science, Technology Review, and the New York Times Sunday Review. Carla writes and lectures frequently on the social impact of robotics and emerging technology and created the world's first children's book on 3D printing, Leo the Maker Prince. She is a co-author of a forthcoming book on smart object designs to be published by Harvard Business Review Press and currently co-hosts the RoboPsych podcast, a bi-weekly discussion around design and the psychological impact of human-robot interaction. She holds an MFA in 3D design from Cranberry Academy of Art and a BE in Mechanical Engineering from the Cooper Union. We welcome you, Carla. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bavia. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes. I will assume so. We already went through that. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit of my own Path. I know that um, when I was in graduate school, it was always exciting to hear about different paths. And, uh, you know, I in particular started out um, as a mechanical engineer because I just had a desire to make, to make things. And, um, you know, quickly learned that there was such a thing as design, but not quickly enough, actually. So I finished my engineering degree and then went back to Cranbrook Academy of Art where I'm currently leading a new program that is called 4D Design. And my focus has always been around um, physical things that had some kind of digital component. To me, the um, embedded electronics actually brought things to life in a way that made it very exciting for me to think about an object having life. And um, so I am, okay. I'm sharing the screen. Hopefully we have, you know what, I'm going to stop share for a minute and just make sure I did that. Um, it sounds okay. 
so my there we go um so my a lot of my career has focused around product design and i've always sought out those uh, opportunities to create physical things again that had digital components and you know there's so much going on around software but my ethos has always been to think about things very holistically and think about every environment and every material that is um, interacting with a person and i worked for many years for firms i worked for frog design and my um most of my time was at a firm called smart design where i led um, an inside r d lab that was called the smart interaction lab and i also worked on a lot of client projects so um what you're looking at now is the neato bot back and they were a startup and i led the interaction effort and what was really exciting about this project for me was that it was, first of all, one of the first robots that would be in a person's home in a real way um, and not just in a laboratory. And it allowed me to think about the three modalities that I think a lot about, which are sound, light, and motion. And so I worked with a composer friend of mine, his name is Scooby Lepofsky, and we came up with uh, an entire um, palette of sounds that I'm gonna play you just a few, but um, you know, designing this robot allowed me to really think about a script around what are all the messages that happen between a person and their product and what are the ways that we can have those messages come through that don't rely on a screen or don't even necessarily rely on, you know, right now we're, we're used to a lot of longhand verbal from assistants like Siri and Alexa. So this is really just kind of the shorthand and uh, the robot can say, I'm started cleaning. Um, or it says, oh, hello. Um, and if we have these alerts that are much shorter, that's what happens when it's tracked or when um, its bin is full. And then we have a wake up sound and a goodbye sound. And, you know, it allowed us to do things like think about brand and think about a digital logo. Um, and then uh, after being at Smart for several years, I branched off on my own and started my own studio. One of the projects I did in my studio was this coat rack that um, is, I talk a lot about the importance of context and not having uh, a person bombarded with everything that's online, even though we could have Twitter feeds and Facebook feeds and stock quotes on um, our um, individual objects because the uh, ability to embed microcontrollers has now become very accessible and very affordable but can we just use that microcontroller to only give us the slice of information that we need at that particular moment in time so just as you're walking out the door you can glance at your coat rack it will greet you just briefly and then it will let you know what the weather is and it will also give you the conditions for the day so you know if you want to grab a raincoat you know if you want to grab your umbrella there's also an umbrella stand at the bottom um, and you know another thing that this project really allowed me to do that I'm very very interested in is challenging our notions of materials around consumer electronics and so this coat rack is largely made out of wood and I experienced experimented with some CNC processes to have the front of it be thin enough so that an LED matrix could show through and um, when you're not interacting with it, it's very quiet and in the corner and just looks like a wooden piece. Um, more recently, I worked on a project that's called the Click Brick and I was approached by a friend who uh, was working with a professional drummer named Conrad Meissner. And uh, he talked to me about how all of the metronomes that he was working with really pulled him out of the zone during presentation. And could we create something that was more specifically for drummers that allowed them to keep drumming while also controlling the metronome? So this is a metronome that you actually turn on and off by hitting, striking with your drumstick. And then you can also put your drumstick around the dial or you can, the buttons there are specifically made for drumsticks to be in it. And, um, you know, we went ahead, we were just kind of a small ragtag group, but um, developed this product as a team. And the product is uh, it's on the market and we have a patent for it. Um, it's called the Click Brick. And that's Conrad there in the background. So you know, he's been traveling with it and bringing it to shows and um, you know, drummers really love it. It fits into their lifestyle and it's really a testament to the idea that form and material 
um, are really just as important a part of the digital experience as what's happening with data. Um, and then I wanted to share installations and experiments um, because I think it's a moment when we need something fun. So this is not in this original presentation, but um, several years ago, I collaborated with a food designer whose name is Emily Balt. We were doing a residency together at the School of Visual Arts, just up the road from Parsons. And um, she's focused a lot around food, and I was focused on putting sensors and everything. And our work came together and manifest in what we call the Lickestra. So this is just best um, shown. Uh, it's an ice cream orchestra. We brought it out to several galleries. We've done several shows with it. Um, we com collaborated with a composer whose name is Aaron Dyer. So it's funny, it's kind of one of the quickest projects that she and I have done in some senses, but it, it actually gets us the most attention and people really have a lot of fun with it. So I do try to recreate it whenever I can. Um, but most of my work in the last five to 10 years or so has been focused on robots. And I had the pleasure when I was at Georgia Tech of being brought on as part of the core team for a social robot. So, um, and I didn't even know that this was a field. Um, there is a field called social robotics that is entirely focused on how we might interact with our physical objects um, in a way that is totally natural and human. So that all we need to do to operate the machine is bring to it our humanity or our um, knowledge of social interaction. So this is a robot named Simon. Simon is specifically created to be in a laboratory to explore how we might be able to teach robots how to do certain tasks. Ro um, Simon has uh, microphones in his head, he's got cameras in his eyes, and he has pads in his hands, and he understands certain specific scripts. So you can say, Simon, take this, and he'll take it in his hand, he'll put it up to his eyes like the flower that you see in the top corner there. Um, and then Simon also responds socially. So um, I put together this kind of collage of him looking like coy and he'll look confused. If, if the robot doesn't understand, like what he would do is you, you, in one of the tasks is around sorting colors. So you say, Simon, take this. And you say, where does it go? And if the robot doesn't know, he'll actually throw up his hands like this. And um, you say, it goes in the green bin. And so uh, the microphone will pick up that sentence and actually parse the word green and then map whatever pixels are in the camera vision to the word green. Um, there have been subsequent robots that came out of the lab. This is Curry, which was the cousin of Simon. That's a fun project for a designer to get a phone call and say, can you make that robot's cousin? Um, Polly was another robot that, you know, as opposed to Simon and Curry that were built from the ground up to be fully social. Ro Polly was really built very functionally. And then I was adding, um, oh, kind of after the fact, this layer of sociability. So um, I worked with a fashion designer whose name is Lynn Soltzis, um, because I knew that I wanted to bring a soft shell to this robot that was kind of harsh. It has a robot arm that comes right from the middle of the body. It was really a Kinect camera on a stick with a robot arm that moves up and down. And what I, I do in a lot of my work is try to use every modality to express what the um, machine's capabilities are. So in this case, I exaggerate the face and let you, let you get a sense of what its range of vis vision is. Um, I exaggerate the ears and I gave it this really soft, friendly coat. And what wound up happening with Polly, this was at the University of Texas in Austin, is it was really, um, uh, used in lots and lots of different situations as an experiment, but wound up becoming embraced by um, folks who were in the hospital business and led to, and I like taking selfies with the robots, um, led to a project that has turned into um, a startup. So Dr. Andrea Tamar, uh, with whom I've worked for the last 10 years, um, was approached to create a company called Diligent Robotics that's based in Austin, Texas. And so I have been head of design for Diligent for 
last three years and we developed Moxie. So this is a rendering of Moxie. Um, Moxie has been uh, built. Um, Moxie, like Simon, has the ability to be expressive um, in several different ways. There's voice response, there's a facial expression, there is also a light at the top. So when I think about design, I think about the um, one foot read, I think about a 10 foot read, or I think about what it's, what it's like down the hall. And Moxie's job is really to um, take a lot of the tasks that nurses do that exhaust them and take them away from um, patients, like sitting in closets and assembling kits or running up and down hallways and delivering things. And um, so Moxie has this big bin for holding objects and can deliver them. So here's a little bit of what Moxie would do. And uh, again, this robot can be trained in a really social way. And I um, pushed back a lot on, I pushed back a lot on um, making this robot so explicitly social um, in such a serious setting like a hospital. I didn't want to create something that was a doll or a toy. Um, but uh, what we found from the research, and um, Diligent has a giant team of artificial intelligence specialists, as well as engineers and um, social researchers who have been working with the nurses and hospitals in several places in, throughout Texas. And they found that um, because the robot is in such a harried environment, having the shortcut of the social interaction that allows people to know, oh, the robot has seen me, oh, the robot is getting too close to me and said, excuse me, so it knows, oh, the robot is looking at the spill and we're both looking at the same thing. And there are many, many nuances of um, interaction that need to take place socially. And uh, so we did actually need to exaggerate those um, social features and it's been getting a really great response from the nurses. So this is a piece that showed up in Fast Company. A hospital introduced a robot to help nurses. They didn't expect it to be so popular. So that's been um, very satisfying for me as a designer and that work is ongoing and continuing and uh, we've got some other products in the works. Um, and then in the meantime, I do really get so excited about this. So thank you all again for inviting me because I really love sharing the passion around it. And um, when given the opportunity, I do talks and I do write. So I did a piece for the New York Times Sunday Review a few years ago, writing about how I don't actually envision robots with limbs and heads and ears, but having just subtle aspects of those, like maybe a microphone that spins around and gives you the sense that it has a head, but doesn't actually look like a head. Um, also wrote a piece for Popular Science around Tesla Autopilot and some of the challenges of making people really understand what the limitations of a robot are and how important that um, sense of understanding the robot's brain, so to speak, is in terms of not having a false sense of security around what the robot's capabilities are. Um, and then finally, as you had mentioned in my bio, uh, when I first started my studio, I did a project around 3D printing because I also love to find things in technology that I haven't had my hands on and explore them. And so what was exciting to me was um, that I had used 3D printing for several years uh, as a professional designer, but I had not experienced this global phenomenon of them being so affordable and accessible. And I wanted to experiment with what would it feel like if I as a designer could uh, design objects and have them appear, let's say in Japan the very next day. And I was also inspired by my alma mater, which is the Marymount School for Girls that had set up a fab lab. And I thought, you know, I think instead of doing a big serious project or an, an essay for a magazine, why don't I actually explore the way that kids are looking at it because they were kind of looking past some of the naysayers. A lot of adults said, oh, you know, that would never be affordable. It wouldn't be practical, this and that. And I just looked at, you know, lots of um, possibilities and laid out seven possible futures. And what I really wanted to do with this book was encourage kids to get hands on as soon as possible when they would have access to a 3D printer. So there are several objects that appear throughout the book, like the sheep is part of the character. Um, 
is one of the characters that is um, very inspired by the little prince who says, draw me a sheet. So the, uh, Leo is called the maker prince. He's the robot. And there's um, a sheet and there's the Carla character and anything that's a photograph in the book is um, can be downloaded through a link that appears at the end of the story and 3D printed. So um, for example, there's a character whose name is Stephanie and the robot's name is Hi-Ho and she's a professional designer. She creates jewelry. Um, I used Rhino Python. So there were lots of little sub projects that allowed me to get my hands dirty. And you know, with the Python was exploring patterns and um, how a jewelry designer might use math in her work. Um, but finally, my big passion project is creating the 4D design program at Cranbrook. So um, I, uh, I, would, I, I, sh I don't know if I should put it this way, but I think Cranbrook stole me away from Parsons. Um, and it was, it would, that, which would be a very hard thing to do because I have a lot of affection and um, passion around the community at Parsons. Uh, but what I was approached with was the opportunity to create an entire department, not just um, individual courses as I had been doing for the last uh, eight years or so, and create a two-year program around this vision of the physical holistic world that is imbued with data and digital properties and what might those explorations be like including everything from um, applied robotics to embedded electronics to projection mapping and um, digital manufacturing so uh, the program was just launched last year was the first year we accepted students um, and we are off and running. We have our second cohort is coming in in just a few days. Um, and the Cranbrook model is very unique in that it's two years of full project based learning and critique. So we don't actually have classrooms or formal classrooms. Everything is done through a project. The program is very small. Um, usually 14 to 16 students max and each of those students works directly with me and I bring in folks who do workshops um, around uh, all of our subject matter and work directly with the students. This year we will do, be doing a lot of those virtually and online. Um, but uh, it allows me to also have this amazing campus as our canvas. And what you see here is the Science Museum. So Cranbrook also ha has an art museum, which is you see here, as well as a Science Museum. And I've been really excited about the opportunity to blend those things and bring them together. And um, this is a project by a student in 2018 just that was inside the portico um, of our art museum. And then um, I do host a podcast. So any of you who are as nerdy as I am about um, everything that's around our hopes, dreams, and fears around robotics and AI is something that my co-host Tom Boriello and I explore on a, usually a bi-weekly basis. We bring in a lot of authors and experts and academicians and practitioners um, to talk about these topics. And then uh, the final thing you heard is um, I am just wrapping up my book project, which again is all around the same topic, and it's called My Robot Gets Me, How Social Design Can Make Products More Human. So um, it's uh, really around what I've just been talking about. and. Um, it's available for pre-order on Amazon, which makes me nervous because I'm still finishing it, but I guess that's how it works. Um, and I don't, I haven't been keeping track of time. Sorry, I'm usually very good at that. But um, this is my contact info and I know you have a series of questions, so let's hit them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. Um, I just want to request you to yeah, stop the screen sharing so that, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful and thank you for all your great work. Um, just to start with our discussion, um, I would like to start by asking one question and then meanwhile, everyone else can uh, share their questions in chat or even use the raise your hand function and then I can call on you. Um, so Carla, my question would be, I went through your research work uh, where you also mentioned your fascination in harnessing the power of computing to physical forms in order to connect with people on an emotional level. Um, so what are your thoughts on how we can channelize that to create new communities and relationships? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So there, 
uh, are these phenomena like what I was describing with Moxie, where you know even though we know very consciously that this object is not alive and doesn't have a personality. Um, when we bring in these dynamic properties of light and sound and movement, we have um, uh, this, we, uh, we allow ourselves to harness this illusion that there is uh, a being in there, there is life in there. Um, you know, there's even like any of, if any of you have studied animation, you may have had to do the flower sack exercise, which you, you draw a flower sack, I see you nodding, yeah. and you have to give this flower sack the sense that it's, you know, excited or despondent or, you know, any other um, modes of expression. And, you know, it's amazing how you can take something, right, that's just a, a, a pillow. I mean, the same thing happens. There have been several experiments and research around, you know, what can you do to animate a box, for example. And I think this is, this is a very, very complex topic, um, you know, in terms of, how all of the things, there's certainly a lot of, um, uh, I think, concerns around abusing this power, right? And, you know, if we have large corporations that are that dissuading us through um, the power of these machines. But I do think that as designers, we can, you know, we, it's up to us to really think about what our values are. And we can harness these things, you know, especially I think that, um, in this time of COVID, this has been a really conflicted time for me because I feel like, oh, every time I open the paper, like suddenly social robotics, suddenly robots are more needed than ever before. We want, you know, uh, the hospital robots for sure, but delivery robots and telepresence robots and um, elder care robots. And I feel on the one hand, like, oh, I'm, I'm quite sad about this because I don't want us to be replacing human contact with the robot. But I do think that, um, you know, we can really take advantage of, uh, you know, like say, say telepresence robots is a great example where, you know, we're using the expression to like, right now you're actually sitting, you're sitting on a rectangle on my lap right now, <laughs> but yeah. you know, I could be, and I've actually, my, I, my hair is, is, is Italian and I, I really want to like get up and gesture and do stuff and you know there are a lot of designers working on that for example on how we have the machine translate my expression into um, sound light and movement again so you know is the robot on the other end gesturing is the robot on the other end you know you know pointing or crouching or and so I think you know, certainly in this time when we are all suffering so much from the absence of each other's presence, we can use the expression of the machine to enhance this video presence. I and mean, that's just one aspect, I think. And, and I also do think that, um, you know, we've seen a lot of great research around um, using robots as therapies for yeah. anxiety and, and uh, you know there's a robot that's called Paro that's a seal it's actually a furry seal that will it will vibrate that will respond to your touch and I've been um, following the research around it and have been really surprised to see how effective it, it's been. Thank you thank you so much Carla. Um, and we have a few questions from our ad audience. The first question uh, we have from Yanis is, does Moxie, the robot, also record its environment? Does it record its environment? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question and a complex question because um, cameras are a big part of the work that I do and they're also very controversial because of privacy concerns. Uh, which is certainly something I think about a lot. The robot does not record. The robot uses the camera as a sensor to be able to understand um, and process its environment. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, we have another question from Sohi, and she says, thank you for the presentation. In your research work, you talked yeah. about the explorations in tangible interaction and mixed reality. 
how do you think that has shifted the way we experience and transcend to spaces? Hmm. Well, I'll be honest. I, so I'm very anxious for my students to really explore mixed reality. And uh, in the Cranbrook 4D program, I have set up a mixed reality space actually that has a grid on the ceiling so that we can hang both um, RGBD cameras as well as the projectors and do projection mapping onto physical objects, which I know um, you guys know all about and are exploring out there at Parsons. And, um, but I haven't seen it in the world, I think, as much as I would like. I mean, I see it in, I think designers are thinking about it, artists are thinking about it, we're exploring it, but I haven't necessarily seen the applications, which I think is what the question was really sort of focused on. So I don't actually see that it's, it's impacted us that much because I don't think we're, we're using it. But I think that, you know, as, um, you know, there's a there was an uh, experimental group called Berg in London a few years ago, and they did a they did a really great research project that they called LAMP, and what they were doing there was um, exploring. Uh, it was a project that was sponsored by Google, and they were exploring what what could Google project products be if they were in the physical world. So one of them was a calendar that would actually have sort of flag that one of them was controlling music and one was the globe. There were several others. And um, what they what they were saying was that you know, when when the light bulb was a very new product, uh, one light bulb was expensive and you might just have one and you would take it from one room and you would screw it and so and they were saying, you know, well, we're we're going to get to a moment when a projector is like that, when a projector could be as ubiquitous enough that we could have it with this room that I'm in right now, I could have a projector um, just in the light fixture, right? And so then everything around me could suddenly become an interactive surface. And so my radiator, I'm, I'm looking at this uh, actually old fashioned radiator in this old Cranbrook building. And um, the radiator controls, uh, you know, I can have some of the controls that would actually projection map onto the radiator so that I, it's the mapping is really super direct. I mean, it might be hot. You know, I'm just throwing out ideas. Um, so I'm not, I, I just, I think, you know, there's a lot of applications. We've seen experiments around cook, cooking and um, digital recipes superimposed on, on our food and our countertop surfaces and that kind of thing. And we certainly see a lot of projection mapping in entertainment. Like we have all those things with the big buildings. But um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're seeing enough of it. That's my answer. Thank you, Carla. Um, we have uh, another question from L Lauren, and she's asking, I hope there's a lot of robophobia out there that is unfounded, but what in one area of robot implementation that you perceive to be a valid concern in the next five years? Hmm. Um, I, I mean, I, I have a lot. I, I think, uh, you know, I have a lot of emotion around elder care because I feel um, there's a fantastic film that is called Robot and Frank, which I recommend to anyone. It's got Susan Sarandon and Frank Langella. Um, and um, there's an elder care robot there. And, and the, the, the fellow who is the main character, the Frank Langella character, feels... Um, really um, angry about this robot being a replacement for maybe physical contact with its family members. And I, you know, I used to, that used to be my bigger fear, but I, I, I mean, I do think I do think vulnerable populations are are a big concern because I did a talk, uh, a TEDx Brussels talk several years ago, and as part of that talk, I threw in these kind of escalating images of the future. You know, I said, well, well, we have a robotic washing machine. And I was like, oh, yeah. And then I said, now we have a robotic dog walker. It's like a drone and it can hold the leash. And people are like, oh, yeah. 
And you know, and I said, do you want that? Do you want to not be out with your dog? Like, it's not why you have a dog. And then, and then I put up this picture of a robotic nanny of my little boy who was four, two at the time, this two year old with this robot nanny and, and people, you know, gasped and they, and they kind of didn't get that I was just po poking at them as an audience, you know, because there was this like flaming on Twitter afterwards. Like, this is terrible. I was like, yeah, I think it's terrible. Like, that's why I showed you that picture. Um, uh, you know, so I mean, I, I think the bottom line is we need to be really careful around vulnerable populations. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, um, Carla. We have a few more questions. I think one from Faye is thank you so much for the talk. What, where do you think is the opportunity to address the issue of individual or community access to robots when thinking of the technology gap and socioeconomics? Ah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's another thing when I have my darker moments around this COVID period and the robot and the and the robotics opportunity, I think to myself, it's it's a more of the bridge this the gap between the haves and the have-nots becoming even more distant, right? You know, um, you know, certainly some populations can afford to pay extra for a delivery robot and for. Um, all the extra charges that are attached there for a telepresence robot to stay connected, um, you know, especially with like um, assisted living and places like that that have been closed to visitors and, um, you know, the ones with the more money have, that have more iPads and more ability to connect. But um, I, I have also seen other projects. So I was brought in as a designer. Um, so, you know, this is my first iPod. pod. Um, I was brought in as a designer to assist on a project by a professor whose name is Michelle Johnson, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, and she's working in a ro rehab robotics lab. And she has been developing a project that was around um, a rehab robot for kids. And the question, you know, we, as a team, we always say, you know, well, what is the benefit? What is the benefit? Why have all these motors and things that can break? And the idea was that um, she was looking at uh, communities that were, uh, had maybe just one doctor in a 200 mile radius and that, you know, where people couldn't necessarily travel or afford to travel to be at a rehab facility. And the idea was, and she really wanted to work on this, there was a lot of back and forth around open source, but work on it as an open source project to be a very affordable robot so that that robot could actually be, so that one physical therapist could then be able to manage care for several kids with the robot being physically in a location in a very small village in a poor community. And, um, you know, I think, I think especially around the open source projects where we can empower um, a, a smaller community to develop their own um, robotics needs. Uh, there can be opportunities. So, I mean, I think, I think that it can be argued either way, but I think it is, a, I think it is a very valid and big concern. Thank you, Carla. Um, I think the last question before uh, we move on uh, was from Ray, who was asking, what do you think the role of robots will be in physical isolation context? Um, like, the pandemic, I'm guessing, is like a lockdown. Is that, I'm guessing. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, well, like I've said before, for sure, telepresence robots. I mean, I do think as much as, um, and I had to go uh, purely on video chat with my own students, which was extremely painful for me. It was my very first group of students in my brand new program. Um, but, uh, you know, felt grateful for this ability to do what we're doing right now and have everyone on video. So certainly I think, 
um, telepresence and um, everything, that, and not just straight up video. I think that, um, I think particularly at design technology and similar programs, there have been explorations. Like I had a, a student group when I was at University of Pennsylvania that was just looking at a pillow that had embedded lights and the ability to vibrate. And you could just really send someone a hug and let them know that you were thinking about them and that they could then receive on the other end. So I do think some of those subtle touches are things that are starting to be explored. Um, you know, certainly at, there are features in um, some of our smartwatches that allow you to send a heartbeat and things like that. I think we've only started scratching the surface of that. And that's really where a lot of my interest lies, I think, as a designer is, you know, what is this nonverbal language that can um, be explored beyond the very heavy text full on video um, that you know we may not need for every interaction. Yeah. Thank you, Carla. And Yanis was just asking the name of the research group. Was it Borg? And their project was called LAMP. And if possible, you oh. could talk about it because it was not clear on the audio. Oh, yes, for sure. Um, it was. Berg, B-E-R-G, and okay. the project is called LAMP. And I think, I mean, I'm certainly happy to send you a link afterwards. I'm perfect. Yeah. I'm, um, but I think if you simply type in, yeah, um, I just no, no I will send you a link afterwards if okay. if if that's okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Carla. Um, it was wonderful. Thank you for being with us, and we look forward to all your work and your book uh, in the future. And thank you everyone for being here today. We will be uploading the talk on the website in the next few days. And in the meantime, we hope you'll uh, join us for the last two events that we have uh, for, the con for, for our show. And you can still see all our amazing projects from my peers um, on mfadt.space. Um, thank you so much for joining today. Um, take care, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to seeing all the projects. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Mm -hmm.